Good evening, faculty, uh, students, and staff, and guests. Uh, thank you for coming to this special lecture. Uh, we hope that it is both enjoyable and informative. Before we begin, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Hee Jin Kim, uh, Professor of English and uh, Dean of Foreign Affairs at uh, Cyber Hangul University of Foreign Studies. And Professor Hee Jin. Okay, good evening, everyone. Okay, I think today is very special for us and for our school as well. You know what? Because we have a very special guest with us. As you know, he is the world-renowned scholar in the field of second language acquisition. So I feel honored, we are honored to introduce Dr. Robert de Kayser to all of you. Well, again, uh, well, I want you to enjoy the lesson. And <laughs> I'm going to pass the microphone to Professor Lee again. Thank you. Okay, um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Robert Decager. Uh, Dr. Robert Decager has taught courses on second language acquisition and research masters at the graduate level and on linguistics and social linguistics, linguistics at the undergraduate level. He's originally from Belgium, where he received a BA in uh, Romance Philology. He obtained his MA and PhD at Stanford University. He has taught Dutch, French, Spanish, and English as a second language, and uh, has also studied German, Latin, Greek, and Japanese. Robert has just finished a five-year term as editor of uh, the Language Learning, uh, which is one of the prestigious journals in SLA, and is co-editor of John Benjamin's book series, studies in bilingualism. He frequently serves as a reviewer for a variety of journals and has published in the AILA Review, Applied Psycholinguistics, Foreign Language Annals, Language Learning, Language Testing, Studies in Second Language Acquisition, the Modern Language Journal, and the Tissot Quarterly, as well as in many edited volumes and handbooks. He published two edited volumes, Grammatical Development in Language Learning, and practice in second language learning. His research interests include a range of topics in the psycholinguistics of SLA, as well as uh, instructed second language learning, the role of implicit and explicit learning, practice and automatization processes, corrective feedback, language learning aptitude, age effects in second language learning, and study abroad. Please uh, extend a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Dickager. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee and Dr. Kim, for your very friendly introductions. Um, this is my uh, very first time in Korea, and uh, after a couple of days here, I already feel like I'm at home because everywhere has been so nice to me. Um, I have a fairly long series of uh, slides to get through, so I guess I will get uh, started right away. Um, if I can find uh, the buttons here, because <coughs> where, where are the, um, the arrow buttons that I had a second ago? Ah, okay, there they are, okay. Okay, so here's an overview of my talk. I'm going to be talking, as you probably know from the abstract, about different forms of knowledge. I'm going to give a few definitions first. Then I'm going to present some empirical research about these issues. And then I'll try to say in a few words what these concepts apply, imply for the role of practice in learning a second language. And very briefly, at the end, I will talk about new methodologies for research. Okay, so first, to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, what does implicit mean? What does explicit mean? Explicit learning is learning with awareness of what is being learned. Implicit learning is learning without that awareness. This is not to be confused with the inductive-deductive distinction. Inductive means going from example to rule. Deductive from rule to example. That is, 
inferring versus receiving knowledge. That's basically the distinction I'm making. So here you have the two distinctions together in a table showing that they are orthogonal, as we say, not to be confused with each other. So what we're most familiar with from the classroom is traditional language teaching, which is both deductive and explicit. You present the rules first and the examples, everything in an explicit way. What some teachers sometimes try is inductive learning, but that's still explicit. If you ask students to discover the rules themselves in a text you present, for instance, that's inductive learning, but still explicit. Implicit learning in a deductive way is really not something we need to be concerned with here. Uh, if you're familiar with Chomsky and theory, parameter setting would be implicit because, of course, you don't think about parameters when you're learning a language as a child, um, but it is um, deductive in the sense that from one type of knowledge you deduce another type of knowledge without having to induce it from the input. And then finally, uh, implicit inductive learning is what the child does in a first language because the child learns from input, derives the rules from the examples, and does that completely implicitly without being aware of the rules. Okay, so, so far, so good. I hope we're all on the same page about this. People sometimes confuse inductive with implicit. So some more terminology, and then I promise for a little while we're done with the terminology. I'm adding two more distinctions here. Declarative versus procedural. Declarative is often called knowledge that, in the sense that you know that the capital of Korea is Seoul, and you know uh, that there is a third person S in English on the verb, versus knowledge of how to do something, um, like knowing how to swim, knowing how to walk, knowing how to program a computer, how to drive a car. Of course, when we are learning a language, very often, initially, what we're presented with is this declarative knowledge in rule form. But of course, what we want to end up with is procedural knowledge. We want to be able to behave in that second language. And then finally, another important distinction is item versus rule knowledge. Um, rules apply to many cases. That's why they are useful. But their execution requires quite a bit of computation. Even if you have used the rule many times, you still have to put the various parts of a sentence together on the basis of the rules. Items do not require computation. That's why we learn many expressions and even things that don't officially seem to be expressions in a second language as items. For instance, we learn something like, as far as I know, in English, that's just a string. Nobody puts that together as a form of the verb to know and so on. No, that's just one chunk of words that could as well be one word. So why teach structure explicitly? Most of you teach structure explicitly, I assume. Why? Well, here are some of the bad reasons for teaching structure explicitly. We've always done it that way, which is probably not a very good reason. Or nobody can do without which I think is true for adults, as I will try to explain today. Why not teach structure explicitly? <coughs> These are two, I think, wrong arguments. Some people will say children don't need it. Well, that may very well be true, but when we're talking about adults, adults are not children. It's not because children don't need explicit knowledge that adults don't need it. And people will often say students who go abroad don't need it. They learn easily, automatically when they are abroad. That is definitely, in my opinion, not true. There is no research that shows that. Going abroad to practice is good, but what happens there is not implicit learning. It's building on the explicit learning you have. Okay, so let's now look in a bit more detail at the empirical research that exists on this point because I've basically just given you a preview. This issue that I will illustrate in more detail is quite important because not only is it of great concern to practitioners, it's also a central topic in many aspects of the more theoretically oriented SLA literature because you can't really talk about anything in SLA without keeping this distinction in mind, whether you're talking about error correction 
or age effects, or curriculum design, assessment, just about any topic you can think of in SLA, the answer you give to a question will be different depending on whether you're talking about implicit or explicit learning. There is a very large literature on implicit versus explicit learning in cognitive psychology, even in philosophy it is a fairly established topic. And towards the end of my talk I'm also trying to show that there are new technologies for studying these issues, although I don't think any of them will uh, give us the right answers to all the questions right away. So, some examples of classroom research that some of you may be familiar with, studies by Lister or Scott Van Patten. What is the problem with classroom research typically? The problem is lack of control. Experimental psychologists don't like classroom research because as you don't have very good control over the treatment, you have lack of internal validity and also lack of generalizability. But when you do research in a laboratory context, as for instance Reber has done in cognitive psychology, then very often you have a lack of validity in the sense that what you're using is not a real language and definitely face validity from the point of view of teachers. So a good compromise in a way is laboratory research on real second languages. Again, I'm quoting some examples here. And this is a, a table from one of my own studies from 1995. You really need to look at only one uh, part of this table here. The most important part is here when we present uh, a somewhat artificial language, a real language, but artificially put together for the f uh, purpose of the experiment, then when we compare explicit deductive learning to implicit inductive learning, we have this huge difference as long as we are looking at new forms generated by the rules the students have learned. So students can, of course, memorize things through all sorts of techniques, but when you give them things that they couldn't have memorized, new forms that they have to derive from the rules they've learned, then we have this huge difference, almost twice as much learning under explicit conditions compared to implicit conditions. So in this laboratory study, clearly explicit learning worked better than implicit learning. But of course you could say, oh, I don't believe in research like that. Um, uh, because it's still very, very artificial compared to what goes on in the classroom, that, that's undeniable. We're already a, st a step forward compared to the research with artificial grammars in the cognitive psychology lab, but it is still an artificial context. So let's then look at some more real research with learners in a variety of contexts. There are two meta-analyses from the last 10 years or so that have addressed this question by pooling the data from many different studies to try to see what works best. I won't make you look at all these numbers here. I know that this is too much. This is just a summary of this table, what concerns us the most. Norris and Ortega did a meta-analysis of a few dozen studies in 2000. And um, what they found is that um, when they compared explicit to implicit learning, the effect of explicit was much larger than the effect of implicit learning. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with this sort of statistics. Basically, a d-value of, say, smaller than 50, doesn't, of 0.5, doesn't mean much at all. 0.5 to 0.8 is moderate, above 0.8 is large. So for implicit learning, you find a very, very moderate, modest effect. For explicit learning, a large effect. When they looked at further distinctions within explicit learning, they found no clear difference between focus on form and focus on forms, which is another distinction that in the literature people have made a big deal of. Now, here's a more recent study. Um, like a couple of people that I know very well, Jamie Ngu is a Korean student at Georgetown, the other in Washington, Gisela Granena is one of our own st uh, students. Uh, again, too many numbers, but here's the summary. The summary looks very similar to what they found in the other study, the Norris and Ortega study, even though, as I'm explaining here, the studies that went into the meta-analysis are really quite different. Of the 49 studies that Norris and Ortega used, uh, only 11 were kept in this summary. They added 24 new ones that had come out in the meantime. So it's based on a very different set of studies, yet if you look at these numbers, effect size, over one for immediate testing after explicit learning, 
0.63 for immediate testing after implicit. This looks very similar to the numbers we just saw for the Norris and Ortega study. Okay, very, very, very similar numbers, even though it's a summary of a very different set of studies. The difference is especially clear when the outcome measure is metalinguistic judgment. That won't surprise you because, of course, when you sit there and judge sentences, you can draw more easily on your explicit knowledge than when you engage in other language tasks. Now, of course, not all rules are created equal when it comes to explicit learning. Um, some rules would usually be considered easy, some very difficult, some in between, and the role of instruction and in particular explicit learning depends on the difficulty of the rules. On the one hand, if a rule is very easy, you may not need to provide instruction in explicit rules. If it's very difficult, it may be hopeless because the students are not all doing a PhD at MIT and they may not be able to process the rule. If the rule is of sort of average difficulty, depending on how easy or how difficult it is, if the rule is rather easy, maybe all you need to do with explicit teaching is just speed up the process. If the rule is a bit harder, maybe you can stretch ultimate attainment in the sense that people will learn things that otherwise they wouldn't without explicit learning. And in the most difficult case, really maybe all you can do is through your rule teaching, make people more aware of certain forms and then hope that there will be more implicit acquisition later on. So that's to be kept in mind that if I advocate explicit learning and teaching, it doesn't equally apply to all structures. Now, assuming that you believe there is value in explicit teaching, then what? That's certainly not the end of the process. As I said in my introduction, we really want to achieve skill, and after explicit learning, skill development implies practice. Practice in psychology is often described as going from declarative to procedural to automatized knowledge. That we can agree on, but there are still many questions about how to do this best, whether we have distributed practice versus massed practice spread out over a long period of time or all together, how specific the practice should be for very specific skills, to what extent there should be focus on form or focus on forms, and most importantly, focus on meaning versus focus on form. So I'm going to try to address all these issues in a bit more detail here. In terms of distributed versus massed practice, the received wisdom from lots of work in educational psychology is that um, distributed practice is best. The same amount of practice spread over a longer period of time is better. But in traditional language teaching, often we have gone overboard doing that. We spread language teaching over a great many years, and some recent studies, for instance, Collins et al. 99, or Serrano, a study coming out in language learning next year, uh, have showed that mass practice can be better if the comparison is, for instance, between practicing something in one semester or in two semesters, if you have the same amount of practice closer together that the learning can be better. Because this, there is a limit on how slowly you can spoon feed if the process is too slow, people have already sort of forgotten what they learned initially before they get to the next step. In terms of specificity of practice, we know from, again, research in cognitive psychology that the effect of practice can be quite specific. For instance, R. Anderson and associates have done research on computer programming showing that if you practice how to write a program, that's not the same as practicing how to read a program and the other way around. Um, I'm showing a couple of studies here of my own where I've looked at similar issues in language learning in terms of comprehension versus production. So here's a study I did with a student of mine at the time in 96, where we look at the effect of input practice and output practice, and where we compare comprehension tasks to production tasks. And what we see here in these numbers is that for uh, the comprehension task, input practice is better than output practice, but for the production task, um, output practice is better than input practice. Not surprisingly, you do better if you are tested on the same skill you have practiced, even though it is the same rules, it's not exactly the same thing using a rule in production and in comprehension. That's something that gets ignored completely in Chomsky and linguistics, because there all you talk about is underlying competence, and there is less talk about processing or skill. <clears throat> 
Okay, in the 97 study, which was a bit complicated, we looked at an artificial language that I called autopractin and taught the students four rules. And two rules were trained in production and two in comprehension. And this was counterbalanced over the individuals. So some people got these two rules in comprehension, those two rules in production, and the other way around. So everybody was taught the same rules. Everybody had the same amount of practice in comprehension and production. The only thing that was different between people is which rules they practiced in comprehension and which rules they practiced in production. So as a result, when we did the mathemat mathematical analysis of the learning curves, we found, first of all, that these learning curves are very, very typical for what you find in skill development in many different areas, whether it's learning how to program a computer or doing algebra or learning how to make cigars, in the sense that at first you get a very steep decline in reaction time, which then levels off, almost reaches asymptote. Here you have this for the comprehension task, here for the production task, quite similar. And then when you look at error rates, again for comprehension versus production, you see that the curves are a bit bumpier, that's always the case with error data, but it's basically still the same pattern, initially very fast progress and then still some slower progress till you reach more or less at asymptote. So the mathematical analysis of these curves really shows that this is a very specific pattern that you find in skill development all over. Here I have one of these huge tables again, but the only thing you need to look at is the difference between same and reverse here, this column. When you compare people who are practicing a rule in a certain skill and who are tested in that same skill for that same rule versus people where you flip things around, then you see an enormous difference in how well they do. Probability values are very, very, very small. In other words, whether you look at comprehension or at production, single task or dual task, or reaction time or errors, people always do much better in the skill that they have practiced than in the non-practiced skill, even though they all learned the same rules and all had the same amount of practice in each skill, just which rule in which skill was different. So the effect of practice is highly skill specific. Very important to keep in mind for language teaching purposes. Now here I'm back with the table from Norris and Ortega. What kind of focus on form, assuming you're going to have practice? Focus on form and focus on forms is an issue I already alluded to. On the one hand, we have the very traditional focus on forms that you see in a traditional form based curriculum where today you practice this structure, tomorrow this other structure. On the other hand, you have what Michael Long and John Norris and many other people have been advocating in recent years. You practice through tasks that are not language tasks, but based on needs analysis and sequence prepared and so on to um, enhance learning of critical forms. Although in some definitions, like Mike Long's, you would only react to errors and not even program forms into um, the, um, the, the sequence of tasks. So in a sense, task-based learning is a compromise between traditional focus on forms and more radical forms of communicative language teaching, although in some definitions it's more closer to these radical forms than to traditional forms. So, to summarize my own opinion on, on, on this point, um, I think it's very important in language teaching to always keep meaning and form in focus. Um, too often what we see is that people will say on Monday afternoon be focused entirely on form and on Friday afternoon only be concerned with meaning. Uh, so for instance then on Monday afternoon in this graph here you would be on this, on this side here where you have quite a bit of complexity of form but students aren't expressing anything they are interested in and on Friday afternoon you may be over here where students express their own meanings they are interested in which will be quite complex but of course they cannot draw on any complex forms either because they don't know them yet or because they cannot retrieve them fast enough. So ideally in the development of language skill which always means combining form with meaning we go through this cube diagonally, oops, I have trouble doing this very well here, <laughs> diagonally, um, in the sense that as practice goes on, let me do this more slowly, as practice goes on, you 
gradually build complexity of form and complexity of meaning till eventually you reach a task here which is difficult in all respects because you need to use complex language forms to um, express complex meaning and at the same time in the back of the cube maybe also under social pressure. Pressure. So say you have to give a job talk in a foreign language that would sort of combine all the difficulties of form and meaning and social pressure. So too often what we do in language teaching is I think from one moment to another we jump around in the cube and that's not good for skill development. Skill development works better if we gradually take people through the cube this way. So for instance role playing could be seen as very much in the middle in the sense that it is uh, more complex meaning that gets expressed than in your typical drill, but at the same time you have some control still over the forms that will be used most commonly because of the way you define the role playing. Okay, that I already had. Um, just like not all rules are created equal, not all learners are created equal. They are very different in terms of age, aptitude, personality, motivation, previous experience, and many other things we could think about. And all of this is very important when we try to answer the question of how implicit, kind, how implicit teaching should be or uh, what kind of implicit, explicit teaching we should use. So first let me talk about the age issue. Adults and adolescents draw on aptitude much more than children, which is fairly easy to show correlationally. So that implies that they learn through different mechanisms, adults much more explicitly than children do. We have a number of examples in the literature that have shown this. Uh, here is an older study uh, uh, that I did in uh, 2000 with Hungarian immigrants around Pittsburgh. What we see here, first of all, is fairly trivial. As age goes up from 0 to 50, age of arrival, age of first learning of the second language, in this case English, proficiency, ultimate attainment goes down. That's of course very trivial, we all know that, that older learners do worse. But the interesting part here is who is going to do rather well, more or less like the native speakers or the very young learners, even though they are on the right hand side of this line here, in other words they learn the language past age 15. Who learns the language past age 15 and still scores in this upper part here? These three people, as predicted, are people with high aptitude. If you're a child, you end up in this quadrant regardless of your aptitude. If, as an adult, you want to learn well, you have to have higher aptitude. Okay. Um, let me talk about the much more recent study now, which just came out in, in Applied Psycholinguistics uh, a week or two ago. Here again, we were trying to relate aptitude to grammaticality judgments depending on age of arrival, but in this case, the L1 was Russian and the L2, the study consisted of two parts, was either English for students in North America or Hebrew for those that were living in Israel. And here, because of the conversion from uh, Mac to PC, my graphs have disappeared, uh, but I'm going to quickly try to reproduce them here if I can. Okay, so as a function of age, when you look at the uh, people for between age 8 and 18, what you find is a decline more or less in this sense as you would expect. When you look, on the other hand, at people between ages, say, 18 and 40, then what you see is more or less a random pattern. There is no clear decline with age. Okay? Very important for all discussions about the critical period, because if there is really a critical period, then the decline has to stop at a certain age. So if you do the appropriate statistical analyses, I won't go into detail because it's hard without having the graphs, but then you see that once you take age at testing into account, that you really find that on average here there is basically no further decline, whereas here, uh, the decline is obvious. Now, the point I really want to make here, that's what I have in the red numbers there, is that here where there is a strong decline as a function of age, there is no role of aptitude. So the number I have there, correlation between aptitude and performance, 0.11, not significant. Whereas here on the other side, what I have <coughs> is a 0.44, which is significant. So for the older learners, in this case, particular, in particular between age 18 and 40, 
How well they do depends on their aptitude, not on their specific age within this range. For the younger learners, how well they do does not depend on their aptitude, it depends on their age. So that definitely shows that the learning mechanisms being used are different because for explicit learning, you need a certain level of aptitude. For implicit learning, you don't need that. Everybody as a child learns his or her native language uh, without, with or without much aptitude. The Israeli data look very similar, so you can just imagine the same graph there that I just drew. The numbers are just slightly different. Now, here is a particularly interesting thing, and again, the numbers are a little bit jumbled because of going from Mac to uh, the PC. Um, we're making a distinction here between three different kinds of structures in Hebrew in this case, highly salient, mid-salient, or low-salient structures. And we're looking at uh, three different age groups, 0 to 7, 8 to 17, and older than 17. Okay? So, this should move to the right a bit. I'm sorry, this, this happens to me quite often when I do something on the Mac and then I show it on a PC, things move around a bit. Now, what I want you to show is that if you look at highly salient structures, age really doesn't make much of a difference, whether you look at the 0 to 7 group or the 8 to 17 group or the 18 plus, the numbers don't change very much. They decline a little bit, but not dram dramatically. If you look at mid-salient structures, the decline is already a bit more obvious, but the real action is down here. When you look at the low salient structures, the difference between the youngest group and the oldest group is huge, more than twice the score here compared to here. So what the adults have trouble with is the low salient structures. Salience interacts with age. Now, why am I bringing this up? because we do know from work in cognitive psychology that salience is much more important for explicit and for implicit learning. So each time you can show that salience plays an important role in the learning process, that suggests the learning process is explicit in nature. Not for children, but because they learn implicitly, but for adults it is. Some of our statistical analyses even go into more detail about what salience means in the sense of what particular element of salience is most important for this interaction between age and uh, aptitude, uh, age and salience, excuse me, and what we find is that things that adults have most trouble with is agreement patterns over long distances, when you have an adjective that has to correspond in gender and number within noun, or in Hebrew, the verb actually is also marked for gender, and when there is a big distance between, say, the subject and the verb, or the adjective and the noun, that plays a much more important role for adults than for children. Another thing that plays an important role in terms of interaction with age is lack of stress on a morpheme. A grammatical morpheme is much harder to learn when it is not stressed for adults. For children, that doesn't play much of a role. So my conclusion so far is that adults and adolescents need explicit learning, and then after explicit learning, they need systematic practice. Now, all of this is, of course, not as simple, as clear-cut as I presented here in just half an hour, so we definitely need more research on many aspects of these issues. And we could do research on artificial grammars, like Arthur Rieber has done, we could use miniature linguistic systems like I have done myself in my 95 or 97 studies, or we could do research with real second languages, either with classroom language learners or learners taken from the classroom to the laboratory for a specific small term, short-term study, or we could look at immigrants. Now, all of these situations have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I won't talk much about the laboratory here because as classroom teachers, many of you are or teach teachers, um, what is probably the most useful is to look at real languages and there we still have to make a further choice between doing the research itself entirely in the classroom or dealing to some extent with laboratory learners. Of course, the problem with the classroom, as I said before, is that it's very hard to really have experimental control over the treatment, especially if you want a more or less longitudinal treatment. It's very difficult to control that entirely. 
And then at least in the US, we have terrible trouble with the bureaucracy. It's very, very difficult to get permission anymore to go into a classroom and to even look what's going on, let, let, alone, let alone have any influence on the teaching process. Although in other countries, that's not necessarily as difficult. And I hope for your sake that here in Korea, it hasn't become as bad as in the US where the bureaucracy has run amok in this respect. You know? um, Laboratory learners can also be very interesting if you are teaching a real language in the classroom, say in your case English is a foreign language for most of you, um, that then you can take students who are at a certain level out of the classroom for extra training in certain structures in the lab. That's still a real language learned by real learners, but you have the experimental control because of your laboratory treatment. So that can be a happy compromise, assuming that you can pay students to go through this extra treatment or somehow get their permission. Of course, the third alternative also exists, looking at immigrants, which is the least controlled of all, uh, but of course it's also very, very real, and what you can do there is um, approach the implicit explicit issue, explicit issue indirectly, as I just showed, by looking at the role of salience or looking at the role of aptitude, you can still have an idea of how implicit or explicit the learning processes are. Now, let me end by presenting some of the newer methodologies for looking at this, not that they solve all problems, but they are interesting to think about in this context. The three I will talk about briefly are eye tracking, uh, electrophysiology in the sense of ERP, evoke potentials, and then very briefly also neuroimaging. Um, so eye tracking, I'm sure you've seen some studies uh, about eye tracking. Uh, this is becoming easier to do all the time. It used to be the case that you had to mount a camera to the subject's head to see to what extent they were shifting back and forth in the text when reading something. Now there are already cameras that you can just put in front of the subject. Uh, so it's becoming easier to do this. It requires, re requires less engineering than a few years ago. And one very recent study is by somebody by the name of Gregory Keating, came out in language learning in 2009. Uh, he looked at learners of Spanish at three different levels and had them read a series of sentences to look at their learning of gender agreement. In Spanish, gender is marked on the article, the noun, and the uh, adjective. And so what he looked at was these three particular problems. Uh, I'll explain this graph in a bit of detail, just bear with me. Um, here, the easiest case is when you have adjectives in the determiner phrase, in other words, uh, the noun phrase, uh, when they are close to the noun. Then here we have adjectives in the verb phrase, removed from uh, the noun in the noun phrase uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the subject. And then here, finally, we have the longest distance where the adjective is in the complementizer phrase. Now, the numbers here refer to the following. It's the difference in reading time between ungrammatical and grammatical sentences. So what do you expect when somebody has learned a rule? If they are reading through the text and they bump into something incorrect, they should slow down. If they know the rule because they are native speakers or because they have learned the language well, each time there is an error, they should say, hmm, what was that? Go back, check, okay? So that would slow them down. So all the positive numbers you find here, in other words, the reading time for ungrammatical is bigger than for grammatical, all these positive numbers show they've learned the structure. So what you see is that for the easiest case, where the adjective is just next to the noun in the determiner phrase, just about all the learners slow down when there is something that doesn't quite work there. But when you look at adjectives in the verb phrase, you already see that only about half of the learners show this difference in the right direction. And then for adjectives in the complementizer phrase, the number is even smaller. So you can, using a technique like eye tracking, expand on your behavioral data and see in a bit more detail what, what the learners are doing under these various conditions. Another technique that's becoming very popular these days is um, ERP. I'm sure you've seen pictures like this before. It looks a bit like a torture instrument, but again, the, 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 the latest versions of these skull caps look a little bit less scary. Um, and essentially what you're doing is, on these various parts of the skull, you are measuring electrical activity. So it's important to realize this is measured on the skull. There is no direct contact with the brain, which means that the location is not very precise. Okay? So when you see uh, colorful maps like this, 
where supposedly you can see how much activity there is in different parts of the brain, say very little here, a lot over there, and so on. This is not really what ERP is for. The people who invented ERP methodology keep saying that don't use ERP for location. What ERP is good at is generating squiggly little lines like this, which show in a period of about one second, as you can see here, uh, the difference in reaction in a specific part of the brain between, say, a correct and an incorrect stimulus. So you cannot locate what is going on very, very precisely, but the point really is the time course rather than the specific location. That's what ERP is so good at, having a very specific uh, indication in a point of time of what happens. So when you look at some of these data, you see quite a bit of difference between the squiggly lines for acceptable and unacceptable sentences. So acceptable is dark, unacceptable is lighter. You can see that there is, for instance, quite a bit of difference here for this electrode, which is pretty much in the middle of the head, central both in front to back and in left to right direction. You see similar patterns for these other two structures that I was talking about. But here's the interesting thing now. Here we're looking at traditional behavioral data, three different grammatical problems, auxiliary use, the number of the determiner, the gender of the determiner. When you look at the difference between the judgments for acceptable and unacceptable sentences, you see that for acceptable sentences for all three structures, the percentage correct is pretty good, 80%. Then when you look at unacceptable sentences where the correct answer is this is wrong, then you see that there is quite a bit of decline in the uh, answers to the extent that for gender of the determiner, you only find about 40% correct, which is less than you would expect by chance. Okay? So when you look at the behavioral data, what would, you include, what would you conclude on this point? Have the learners learned anything about the gender of the article? No, because they score at chance. But then when you look at the ERP data, there you see that there is quite a bit uh, of difference. These are the gender determiner um, data. Um, look, especially on this electrode, but also on some of the others, you find quite a bit of difference in reaction between, for the correct versus the incorrect stimulus. So what Tokovic and McQueenie argue is, look, you have some evidence here of some sort of forming, that is, some, some sort of learning that is going on that you cannot yet measure with behavioral data, but it's there in the brain data. And this may be hard to believe, and I probably wouldn't believe this myself if I only had this study to rely on, but there are other studies in other areas of cognitive neuropsychology outside of second language learning uh, that have shown similar patterns, that sometimes the behavioral data show no learning, but you can show through ERP that there is something going on already. Okay, then fMRI, I'm not going to say much about, because even though it generates colorful pictures and it is better at locating in the brain what is happening, uh, for our purposes it's usually not all that useful because it does not pinpoint specific events. It has very, very poor um, temporal resolutions, as people say. So let me skip through this, but still at least mention uh, these data, which are from a similar technique, not fMRI, but PET, positron emission tomography. And what you see here is very applicable to the skill acquisition theory kind of stuff I'm talking about. Here you see the same brain seen from three different angles in a so-called naive learner, naive in the psychology of not trained, having had no experience in this particular thing. So you have a new task and you see quite a bit of activity in different parts of the brain. Then after quite a bit of practice on the same task, you have far less activity. So even here, for instance, where there was so much going on, you don't see anything anymore. And you only have some remnants of activity in a couple of places here in the cerebellum. Okay, so then you introduce a new variant of the task. And again, you see more areas lighting up, so to speak, but not as much as at the beginning. So what you see here is a, is a qualitative change, depending on how much practice you've had with the task, different parts of the brain are involved to different extents, again showing we're talking about very different processes, not just better or worse performance. Okay, so let me try to come to conclusions sometime soon. Um, 
I hope to have convinced you that implicit and explicit knowledge are very different things, that hardly anything sensible can be said about language acquisition and use without making this distinction, that making the distinction experimentally in the cognitive psychology lab is pretty difficult, or maybe I should say hopeless, that making the distinction, as I'm trying to do um, indirectly in some of my own work, is a bit messy, and that electrophysiological and neuroimaging methods hold promise, but I want to stress that we have a long way to go before we really understand very well what they tell us, and I certainly object to the fact that sometimes people seem to think that the neurological data are more precise than the behavioral methods. Okay? They are interesting as a complement to the behavioral methods, but I think it's a bit naive to think they are more precise. We have decades of experience designing experiments, eliciting behavioral data, um, and still when we look at the neurological data, often it's very hard to know exactly what they mean or to set up an experiment where we can have very, very subtle manipulations of the stimuli and see a difference in the behavioral, in, in the neurological data. So they are good for certain things, but not necessarily better and certainly not necessarily more precise. They are just different. All right, so um, I'll stop here and let you ask questions. I've gone pretty fast, so I'm sure there will be Quite a few questions. Okay. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Are you familiar with certain, I'm just not doing second language acquisition, I apologize. Mm -hmm. even Robert Sternberg's Torahic Theory of Intelligence, mm -hmm. how students can develop language in their own pace, and it's the instructor who has to be responsible to reach out to all kinds yes. of learners. That's an idea that is dear to my heart. You know, what, what you're alluding to there is usually known in educational psychology as aptitude treatment interaction, that you look at how you should teach differently to people with different aptitudes. That's, of course, a very commonsensical idea. The problem is that there is, in, f in spite of this being a commonsensical idea, little empirical research on this point, certainly in our field of second language learning, that I know there is more in other areas. But then, even in these other areas, the results can get very complex because the question is what kinds of aptitudes are you going to look at, what kinds of combination of aptitudes in combination with what treatments, what kinds of combination with treatments. So it is very difficult to replicate the results. Sometimes people think, okay, in, in a traditional study where you don't look at different aptitudes, you just have a simplistic experiment, two different ways of teaching, you find inconsistent results, it's because you don't take into account that different students have different aptitudes, and if you look at aptitude, you'll see there's a pattern. Yes, that can be, but sometimes, <clears throat> as the pattern in ATI research is more complex, it becomes even harder to replicate. And then you get what Kronbach, the, the, the harder, so to speak, of ATI research called the Hall of Mirrors, that everything endlessly interacts with everything and, and keeps reflecting indefinitely. Uh, so I very much believe that ATI research is important, and, and if there is anything practical that we can do in this field, I would advocate for ATI research. But, as I said, what aptitudes, and then also how are you going to measure them? Even the most obvious aptitude in our field, that we traditionally call modern, learning, modern language learning aptitude, as measured through the MLAT, is a very, very debatable construct. The test that we use for it is from 1959, Carol and Sapin, and devising a better test is much harder than it seems. A number of people have tried and failed, and now at Castle, at the University of Maryland, a number of people, dozens of them it seems, have been engaged in a project for years putting a better test battery together, and they now finally, I think, have this battery and are now doing research testing it out with different kinds of learners at different levels. So just designing one good test for one particular aptitude is already a huge undertaking, and we're not even talking yet about ATI research. So, on the other hand, another answer to your question is that some of this business of multiple intelligences and so on has been exaggerated because it's definitely true that different learners learn differently. 
and that you will, read, that you will reach better results, obtain better results, if you teach in a way that is more compatible with the learner. But how many people fit into some of these of Gardner's categories? Very often, we're talking about large numbers that are a certain way, very small numbers that are a different way. So for instance, how many learners would say, I'm mainly an auditory learner, not a visual learner at all. I, I know at least one student who is that way, but most of us these days are more visual than auditory. Okay? So as a result, again, the practical implications are not always very clear. Because even assuming now that you can shove aside most of the problems I've alluded to, then you still have the issue of how am I going to apply this in my classroom? And if you only ha can expect to have one or two students who are a certain way compared to all the others being the other way, it's difficult to have two different ways of teaching in the same classroom, even if you know that X is going to be better than Y for these students versus those students. So <clears throat> in principle, the idea is an obviously good idea, and I always advocate for more research in the area, but it's not like it will be an easy solution to all of our problems. Does that answer your question? Also, also um, like I said before, teachers have to find ways that all students come up with different, or progress in different levels. It's the teacher's yeah. responsibility. And then there's a lot of research shows that students learn best when they are actively involved and actively engaged mm -hmm. instead of being passive learners. Yeah, well that of course is a principle that applies pretty much to all learners, that you have to engage them instead of, of letting them uh, be passive, but again then the question is actively engaged in what? Okay. For different learners what they have to be actively engaged in ideally will be different things. So for some learners it will be concentrating on the grammar, figuring out the grammar rules by themselves, but that's not something I would advocate for all learners. Explicit Inductive learning, as I called it at the beginning of my talk, is not for everybody. The, uh, the advantage is you can actively involve your learners instead of presenting the grammar and them sitting there watching it. You, you can make them find it out for themselves, but this only works for the best learners and the easiest rules. If you have weaker learners try to figure out the pattern for harder rules, you're just confusing them. If you want to vary your teaching methodology, well, if you have pretty good students and you're teaching a certain grammar rule that is fairly easy, maybe you can let them figure it out by themselves. But otherwise, you're just frustrating the students, and then even if after they've tried and failed, you present the right rule to them, um, because they have been trying to figure it out for like half an hour, and then you only have a few minutes at the end of class to say, well, this is really the correct rule. What they really have processed most of the time may be the erroneous information rather than the information you give at the end of class. Okay? So um, act, act, actively being involved in the learning process is obviously good, but how, that, that's yet another question. Yes? Yeah, I had a question um, maybe to ask you to contextualize locally here. I'm involved in a lot of teacher training, mm -hmm. particularly this week, of teachers who are going to be teaching young learners. And you've been here a week or so, I think, and you're aware that lowering the level at which English is taught is going down yes. to first grade, right? right. And um, what I'm seeing is that people who are the teachers now have come from very much explicit grammar teaching, mm -hmm. but they're being asked to teach exactly. young learners. And so yes. I wondered if you, wondered if right. you could localize this right. implicitness yes. and expand okay. on that. Yeah, I'm learners. glad you asked this question because a lot of people think these days, not just in Korea, but in a variety of other countries, this is going on in Korea, in Japan, in Spain, in many parts of the world, that if you start teaching younger learners and you do just the same thing otherwise, you're going to reach better results. There is no evidence of that from anywhere in the world. The age research that we keep referring to is almost all with immigrants. Children who come here at various ages are dumped into a second language environment, whether it's Korean here or, or, or English in the US or Spanish in Spain, whatever. They, being young and being in an immersion environment, learn implicitly. And of course, the earlier they start, the better they will do. And in the sense that if they really start later at age 16 or 18, or certainly 20, they will never be like native speakers anymore. But this is a totally different issue comparing this to what is going on in foreign language teaching in the elementary school. Because there, first of all, typically you only have a few hours a week, maybe four hours, generalizing across the globe. Um, and 
um, you are in a classroom context. So if you try to do the same thing you've been doing before, teaching explicitly four hours a week to these younger learners, you're going to achieve less than before because children are good at implicit learning, not explicit learning. So if you look at the one big study that exists, as far as I know at this point, from anywhere in the world on exactly this point, it's a study done in, in Spain, Barcelona, with English as a second language, where they look at students who started learning English in the classroom at different ages and then compare them after the same amount of instruction, say after 500 hours, after a, a year or two years or you know, whatever, depending on how, how much concentration there is. After 500, year, after 500 <laughs> hours, <laughs> 500 hours of instruction, who does best, do you think? The 12-year-olds, who were 12, I mean, when they started, do better than the ones who were 10 when they started, who do better than the ones who were 8 when they started. Why? Well, in this classroom context, because of the way the teaching is done and because of the limited amount of exposure, the only thing that can work is explicit learning. Who is better at explicit learning? The older ones. It's really the same like asking the question, who will do better at algebra? A five-year-old, a 10-year-old, or a 15-year-old? That's not a very difficult question, is it? Well, if you're going to be doing explicit teaching of grammar, and if that's all you do because you don't have much time for a lot of exposure, then the older the better. Now, the other question then becomes, if you're stuck with this mandate to start teaching at a young age, what can you do? And certainly there I do not advocate explicit teaching. You're going to be wasting your time. You cannot teach you know, subject raising or C command to a six-year-old. Okay? So there, the best you can do is to try to approximate the massive input that the immigrant, immigrant get as well as possible. But when I say approximate, that's a very loose use of the word approximate because you just cannot really do that in the classroom if you have three or four hours a week. So what we see is that in the classroom, regardless of what people really do, after a number of years in grade school, students haven't learned very much. And that those who only start learning, say at age 12, fairly quickly catch up with the ones that started much earlier. Okay? So I have nothing against foreign language in the elementary school. It doesn't do any harm, but Indirectly, it could harm our profession because if we make people believe that just by starting at age six, they are suddenly going to be phenomenal in the second language at age 18, even though otherwise we don't change anything, that's a totally naive idea. So what we need to do is to, well, if we're going to start early, have something more like an immersion program, like in Canada. But of course, that's unlikely to happen in Korea, in, in, in Japan, in China, because where are you going to get all these teachers who, in grade school, can provide all this massive native-like input all the time? That's just totally impossible. And the one thing that students at that age are probably best at at all compared to adults is learning pronunciation. And that's typically going to be the biggest problem because even though the teachers may know the grammar well and may be fluent, how many teachers in rural China have a perfect English pronunciation? None. Okay. So English or foreign language generally in the elementary school is a very problematic idea. It doesn't do any harm, but it has not been proven to do much good either. And indirectly it could give a bad impression of our profession if we make these claims and then it turns out it doesn't work at all. A couple of years ago I had a conversation with a colleague of mine in Pittsburgh who was both a neurologist and a computational linguist. And he had a son who was like 10 years old and who had been in a French program, French as a second language uh, or a foreign language if you prefer, in an elementary school in Pittsburgh. And he said, well, I'm a bit disappointed because my son has been in this French classes now for I don't know how long it was, but he said all he can do is you know, count to 10 in, in French and that sort of a thing. And I said, well, are you surprised? You know, you're a neurologist, you're a psychologist, you're a linguist. Uh, what, what do you expect? There is absolutely not enough time for any implicit learning to take place there. And the explicit learning either doesn't work at that age or isn't done. Because in some cases, you know, what teachers do is pretty much um, play certain games which the, the students react to positively and maybe that's the best they can do because you certainly cannot spend a lot of time teaching grammar. So there is a certain incompatibility between the age of the learner 
and the contextual constraints, namely the classroom and four hours a week. And that's something you, you, you cannot do much about. So if you want to start much earlier, you will have to radically change many other things. First of all, the very least, your teaching methodology, but hopefully also the number of hours of exposure. 